Welcome to another off-season edition of Spits and Suds. I'm Gavin Spittle of 105.3 The Fan. He's coming off a Stanley Cup celebration. My co-host of Spits and Suds was in Vegas as Vegas takes home the Stanley Cup. He's Sean Shapiro. And where did Sean end up? Let's start with that. We have a ton to talk about today, but where did Sean end up after Vegas wins the Stanley Cup? Were you on ice? Tell us about that whole experience. Uh, Yes, I didn't have, I mean, I didn't have the glamorous, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't at the after party or anything like that, but, uh, I was how, how it works with, uh, if you're covering the Stanley cup final, um, and you're watching on the TV at home. So you, you see the cup get passed around to players and about 20, about 20 minutes after the cup's been awarded, they open up the gates to the Zamboni door and it kind of, uh, and that's when media members alongside family members for players and everything like that can all kind of stream onto the ice. So the team, the exact team only gets like 20 minutes to themselves within that bubble. And then family members come on and media members come on. And then it's kind of, uh, it's just kind of chaos where you're, I mean, you're, you're walking around, you're trying to, uh, track down, uh, you're trying to track down all of you're trying to track down people to talk to. Like I was writing, I, I wanted to write off of the game on the, uh, I wanted to write something about the, the four Vegas goalies, right? Cause Vegas had four goalies and pads there for the team picture because of injuries. And I've good segue to just a, not segue a tease to a topic. We'll t- we'll discuss mm-hmm. later in this podcast. But so I was kind of trying to track down all four goalies and the, uh, and the Vegas goalie coach, Sean Burke, while also running around, jump, talking to some other people too. Uh, and, uh, kind of a cool, uh, Texas, Texas actually stars connection here on this. Um, so, um, you go out there and, uh, one of the, obviously everyone knows the Riley Smith connection and everything like that yep. with his time in Dallas, but, um, kind of cool has former this is a this is a deep cut for the the people who are maybe okay we're ready former former tech so uh georgie lopez um used to be the assistant uh equipment manager with the texas stars actually was the uh, assistant equipment manager with texas in 2014 when they won the calder cup um and is now the head equipment manager manager for the henderson silver knights in the ahl and for the playoffs um since Henderson was out of the playoffs uh, and they've got all the black aces and everything like that. Vegas had him working on the NHL staff for the playoffs. And so uh, it was actually kind of kind of on a personal level to kind of see someone and in media, like the equipment guys kind of become like your de facto friends because so much in media when you're covered so much in media is just waiting. And Gavin, you guys know this. It's yeah. so much of it is just organized waiting. It's just you're sitting there, you're waiting for an availability, you're waiting for a guy to finish a workout. You're just so much is just you're just waiting, waiting, waiting. That's what it is. And the um <laughs> and uh and you get to know the equipment guys pretty well. And so I I have a pretty good friendship with uh with with Georgie with Georgie and he uh it was kind of cool to see uh I, I knew him back in all the way back in 2014 when he won a Calder Cup with Texas, and now he was on the ice. Uh, he was on the ice to celebrate a Stanley Cup championship as part of the the Vegas staff. And uh, he's now got a little guy, and he, his wife and son were on the ice too. And like the players are great stories and everything like that. But we see all of the support staff, the assistant coaches, the families. When you kind of when you see all of those people on the ice after a Cup win, and you see kind of and you think about kind of. Uh, extra two and a half months of work that they're doing during all of this. And they're not on TV and all of these things. Like it's kind of cool to see that after a cup win, because I I thought one of the things that Mark stone did a really good job of um, when they were passing the cup around and everything you could, he was obviously all the players are getting it, but they went out of their way to make sure the the equipment guys got it. The massage therapist got it like that. It's a lot goes into this. So it's uh it's uh it's definitely it's one of the cooler things and it's it's kind of cool too to see it happen um for a team to win it on home ice because of the uh because because 
you actually have people sticking around. So like when you actually have the fans sticking around and cheering and everything like that, as opposed to when a team wins it on the road and it's kind of like, it's just the smattering of people who will stick around for the cup hoist, but then really leave. So it was cool. It was a really cool night. And it's, uh, and obviously it was Vegas and we saw what that party was like. Uh, if, if anyone <laughs> saw the highlights, um, from the parade. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> I mean, but let's be honest, shirtless on the strip on a Saturday night. That's just a normal Saturday night in Vegas. So I don't yes, think William yes. Carlson was any different. <laughs> yes. That was the interesting. So that was one of the interesting things about, about Vegas. So all of there's all the energy and the excitement and the arena and everything like that. But one of the really interesting things is so like after, uh, I finished up my work and I'm getting ready to leave the arena. One of the really interesting things about Vegas is, and, and you've, yeah, Gavin, I know you've lived there before. Yeah. So you know, this. like, like part of it, it's, it's so insulated. It's so set up for all of mm -hmm. for in, indoor activities. So like, while there was definitely energy on the strip and people excited about Vegas winning the cup, the cup was already inside one of the nightclubs. The players were already inside. It's, it's a very interesting yep. city where like, all of us, like it's, you can hide, like it's the way parties and, and, and celebrations can be hidden in the midst of it all is very interesting. Cause you walk out you see the confetti on the ground you see people walking around with Vegas jerseys and excited and everything like that. But it's not like other cities where, um, you have to celebrate outdoors. Like it's, it's set up to basically hide everything. And it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's an, it was a very interesting space because it's like, you walk out a couple, you walk about three to four hours after the cup's been awarded and everyone's already inside somewhere celebrating. It's just an interesting experience where right. like hypothetically, if, if Florida had won, if Florida had won or, or, or whatever, um, or if, if hopefully someday when we're hosting a, a pod about this after Dallas wins, it's going to be, people are going to be outside celebrating because Dallas isn't a place that's set up to, to hide celebrations. <laughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, I actually tweeted as a former resident of Las Vegas, I will tell you that this celebration can also be labeled a typical Saturday night in Vegas. Vegas does mm -hmm. it right when yeah. it comes to celebrations because they do so many. I mean, F one's going to be there later this year. Yeah, a New Year's Eve. They just they get it. They know how to do it, so it's going to be contained. It's going to be done right. There won't be riots. The casinos won't allow that. I mean, there's just so many things that I think is is fascinating. That's why. So many conventions and, and, and candidly, you know, and that's where you're going to see all-star games gravitating toward Vegas as well as, you know, with the Super Bowl going to Vegas this year because Vegas does it right. And they just know how to do it and they have the facilities to pull it off. So, um, yeah, in yeah, interesting. Okay, so final thing on that. Does Sean yeah. Shapiro in his hotel room change his shoes for firmer grip knowing that he might be on the ice that night? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. I am. Uh, I, 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 I don't. I was wearing the same shoes. Um, they got they get a little bit cold, but at the same time, when you have all the people there and mulling around it, the ice conditions become becomes more of like a organized. Sl I mean, it's not got it, like, got it. but it's just it's not it's not really. It's so walked on, so tread on at that point where it's not really that slippery yes. anymore. And let's um, keep that question between yeah. us, Spits and Suds listeners. Let's not forward that to Craig Ludwig. Okay. I do not yes. need any <laughs> negative feedback on that, but I seriously would be afraid to slip on the ice. <laughs> I will say, so I will say my, um, so my, my lovely wife, Christina, when, when she, when we were in Austin and she was the uh, team, she was the team photographer for the Texas stars for a couple of years. And uh, she had, a, and, and some photographers and some equipment managers will have these little, uh, little uh, like plastic pullover spikes that they'll mm -hmm. put on to their over their shoes so it's uh so like when like you see how quickly an equipment manager gets to a player takes the puck to the face or whatever a lot of times like now they're they're used to walking on ice all the time but part of it also is they've got that like that built in there because time is of the essence yeah so, uh I, I didn't need those for this but okay those are uh those are kind of a, a inside a inside baseball type note i guess so no, you're 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 absolutely right uh one other note we just wanted to throw in there we could toot our horn um, after the podcast. Uh, the Penguins named Jason Spetzer as their assistant <laughs> general manager. Yes. And I did tweet out, if you listen to Spitz and Suds last week, our own Sean Shapiro brought this up to keep on our radar. So I wanted to give you kudos, my friend, as a, a terrific insider for uh, this program. That leads us to our first topic. So if you mm -hmm. go to uh, Shap Shots, 
Um, Mm -hmm. Sean has an article today that is fascinating, and it's regarding Senators forward Alex DeBrinkett. So why don't you dive into it? He's a scorer, only five foot seven, but that doesn't stop him. Uh, flies around the ice. Many Stars fans will know him better as a former Chicago Blackhawk. So let's go yeah. into what your article talks about. Yeah. So I mean, and now, so Alex DeBrincat is going to be one of the biggest names um, in this this summer, and part of that is his who he is as a player part of that is the nature of the ufa market where it is not a super strong ufa market um but to bring it was you may remember last year he was at the draft he was flipped from chicago to ottawa at the draft last year in montreal and uh went to went to ottawa and he was okay um he didn't have a great year he was okay and it doesn't look like there's going to be a long-term marriage for Debrinket and the senators and he's a restricted free agent with a nine million dollar qualifying offer but the senators um instead of qualifying him have filed for team arbitration um for a quick side note so um there's two different types of arbitration in the nhl there's player arbitration and there's team arbitration um if a player has arbitration rights in, in both cases basically what it means is both sides come to the table they say, here's our deal, here's your deal. And uh the arbitrator will will give a uh will sit will will come to a ruling on okay, this is the deal. And that that's 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 essentially how it works with player filed arbitration. When a team files arbitration, it's slightly different where there will be both sides will come to the table with this is our deal, this is your deal, the arbitrator will figure something out. But when the team files for it, if uh if they don't come to an if they don't come to a multi-year agreement, it defaults to a one-year contract that is worth 85% of the qualifying offer. So for Debrinkit, who would have had a nine million dollar qualifying offer, that would mean a one-year seven point six five million dollar contract this season with Ottawa that would take him to unrestricted free agency. Um Debrinket may play in Ottawa on that deal this year. He may play in a long-term deal. Either way. It looks like he will probably be on the move. It looks like he could be traded somewhere where he plays simply on that one year deal. But if Debrinket wants to go somewhere where he's willing to go long term, he doesn't have a no trade clause or anything like that, but he has been, he has given Ottawa a list of teams that he would sign an extension with, uh, basically kind of like the sign-in trade that we saw with uh, Damon Severson going to Columbus, right? Mm -hmm. And um, from, I've talked, I've seen some reports, but I I know I have heard just personally uh, that I know both that the Dallas Stars are on Alex DeBrinkett's list of teams he would sign an extension with. Um, I know the Detroit Red Wings are also on that list. I don't know for, I haven't heard personally, but some pretty well-sourced people have reported that the other teams include Vegas, um, Nashville, and Florida. Um, It's so to bring it is a viable option for the Dallas stars, which is an important thing. The other important context I want to apply here, just for people to remember before we go down the, should the stars shouldn't they, this is, this is a player want. This is a player giving a list of teams he'd be willing to sign for. This is not, there's still, there's still lots of other moving parts, but one of the, but this is the players want. This is not necessarily Ottawa saying we want to trade with Dallas. So keep that in mind. This is not Pierre Dorian coming down and saying that. The other thing about it too is it's interesting because, and this is, um, this is Dallas being part of the, of the teams on Debrinket's list that we know of. Detroit is his hometown. Um, returning home is always attractive. But the other teams: Dallas, Vegas, Florida, Nashville. What do they all have in common, Gavin, when it comes to the income taxes? <laughs> <laughs> none. They all have none. And uh the uh and obviously Vegas and Florida were in the conference. We're in the Stanley or played for the Stanley Cup final. Dallas was in the conference final. Um to bring it was basically told Ottawa I'd love to either go home or play for a cup contender that where I don't have to pay state income taxes. And if you're Dallas, it's a muscle and it's an advantage you flex. If Toronto is allowed to flex that, hey, you got all these guys from Toronto wanting to come home, you're Dallas, you're Vegas, you're Florida, flex that you don't have to pay state income taxes here and use that as a tool. I have no issue with that. And um, 
I think it's it's a really intriguing thing where whether it's the move the stars make or not, I personally think you at least owe it to yourself to do the due diligence on what this could be, on what this could mean, because um, you have a play, a young player who is a scorer and it's not a short term. It wouldn't be a short term thing. Um, I think you at least owe it to yourself to look, take a, take a long, hard look at this um, because yeah, just it's, I, I know there's other things and we'll go through some of the trickle down, but Dan, Gavin, if I tell you, you can have one line where all of a sudden you have, you have the hints next year, you go and having the hints, Pavelski um, Robertson line rolling out. And then all of a sudden you have a, a pure actual goal scorer on the second line right away. I mean, it's massive. This Dallas, this Dallas team is dangerous. Though. Yeah. Like just, I mean, I know there's other trickle down and we'll talk about it, but like, to me, this is something where if you're Jim Nill and the stars, you at least owe yourself to have the hard conversations about what you're doing, especially since this is not a 30 plus player. This is not a one, two year thing. This is a guy who would be willing to sign a seven, seven year deal with you. So let's go through some basics about Alex Debrinkat to fill yeah. what Stars fans want to know about him. As Sean mentions, just 25 years old. So a lot of time uh, left. Um, you could actually make an argument, even though you know he's been solid his whole career, that his prime is probably the next few seasons. Uh, just a, just a, a, for his size, 5'7", five, 5'8", five, about 175, the durability sticks out to me. I mean, when you look at the career... You know, in Chicago, mm-hmm. 82 games, 82 games, played 70, and then 52, but 82 for Chicago, and then 82 this year for Ottawa. I mean, the guy's reliable. Yeah. So yep. um, that's that's really solid. And the point production is just consistent, um, you know, in the 60s or 70s for the, for the most part. Um, just, a, just a terrific uh, uh, point production player. Um. I guess my question is, Sean, and you're right, Jim Neal would have to, you know, be the other side that says, hey, we want to do this and explore. I guess my question is, is while that provides that amazing scoring punch that we all want, does that prohibit me then for fixing what's going on on my blue line? Or is it just a mass production that would quiet down the blue line issues that the stars faced at times this season. Yeah, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting it's an interesting interesting conundrum yeah. because um I think it's for one it's hard to get the Debrinket deal done without another move. Just realistically cap space and everything like that. You're looking at you need to budget around 8 to between 8 and 9 million for him. Um, I think that's, that's, that's something you'd have to budget around. You'd probably be looking similar to how you budgeted for Jason Robertson. Um, I think this, to get this done to me, there's two pieces that would have to, to have, that would have to happen. Um, for one, obviously you'd be picking to bring it over. You're, you're not bringing back, uh, Domi and Dadanov then you're picking, right. you're picking to bring it over them. Um, which is, I'm, I'm not opposed to that one's like. I know they were both, I know Dadanov was a good fit, but you got two, you got a young, you got a player who you get long-term, more long-term upside. I think it's a better move for today, tomorrow, five years from now, to steal Jim Nill's cliche line about how he looks at managing the franchise. Um, you also would have to, I th- you'd have to go through the Ryan Suter buyout. And we've talked about that. And I was already on board for the Ryan Suter buyout. I think this is just another proof that that type of move opens you up to be ready when a young, really good player wants to come to your team. And the other thing that I think it's it's impossible to do any of this um, without, you're going to have to find a trade partner for Radic Foxa. I think it's it comes to the point where, and this is nothing against how Radic Foxa plays the game. And we've talked about it before, but that $3.25 million contract and him playing a fourth line center role when you could get Luke Lindenning to play that fourth line center role for less than a million dollars next year. I think it's, I think, I think you, whether it's part of the trade back to Ottawa or it's part of a separate trade to another team, I, I think 
there's I don't see a space where you can have both Dabrinka and Foxa on the team next year. I think that's 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 something you have to accept. And I also think it's something that's I, I think that's something that's a trade you're willing to make. The Is blue it, line. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go. No, continue, continue, continue. Oh, because I was oh. going to go into part two of my question <laughs> yeah, to yeah, you yeah, as yeah, far yeah. as what do you give up? Is it more valuable for Ottawa to do a sign and trade rather than, you know, just ship them to the stars and then the stars sign him? Because, you know, you do mm-hmm. look at it and it is a player with pending free agency unless you sign him long term. I'm sure a long term deal would be part of the equation. Um, so I think, and what am I giving up, Sean? Is it a, is it a first round pick? Is it, mm-hmm. um, obviously you want to protect Stankoven, um, but, you know, who's in the mix as far as, um, if you sign him long term, you're getting that, you know, you're getting a 25 year old player. I'm guessing you would have to, Ottawa will, will be looking at a Stankoven, we'll be looking at a Maverick Bork. Um, we'll be looking at players like that plus some picks to make it happen. Yeah, it's. I mean, I don't think it. It, it feels very similar to, and, and now not to the same class of player, but it feels very similar to the discussion Dallas and Ottawa had years back when it was, "Do you trade Eric? Do you?" Yes. Ottawa. Ottawa wanted Miro Heiskanen. Rightfully so. They should have wanted Miro Heishkinen for Eric Carlson. And the Stars went relent on that. Then, and they were willing to part with Julius Honka, but not uh, Miro Heishkinen. And just both sides stuck to their guns. And I think both sides ended up getting what they wanted in that deal. Um, by the deal that d- didn't happen between Dallas and Ottawa. Obviously, Debrinkat is not Eric Carlson. Um, and I don't think I don't think he would be... I'm not sure that he's going to force the the return of a of a Stankoven. Um I I do I do think you start to have an interesting discussion about Maverick Bork because I think um now he's a first round. I know he's also a first round pick, but I think it, it's 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 one of those kind of classic things where if I come to the table what do you Gavin I'm like like, hey, I have these three. You can have anyone you want, but these three forward prospects. Mm-hmm. You're immediately going to say, "Well, I want one of those three forward sure prospects." Sure do. You, yeah. cle- you, cle- yeah. you clearly, you clearly have, uh, <laughs> you clearly know something. <laughs> you clearly know something about those three guys. So, um, I, I think you could get it done. But I do think Dallas's pool is deep enough where I think you could move some other picks and prospects. Um, and I think, and, and another player to, to move it and, and get it done. I also think Dallas has the advantage of, well, and this, like the same could be said for, for Vegas and, and for, for Vegas right now and, and, and Nashville that, that they have the, they have the advantage of being in the Western conference where, um, I do think there's going to be a little bit more of a in division tax on, Detroit getting a deal done where like, like Detroit can easily give Ottawa the most for Debrinka. They can, they can they have, nearly they have 31 million in cap space. Yeah. And they have five picks in the top 43 in the draft. Yeah. Dallas doesn't pick till 40, I think. Yeah. Right. Is that yeah. was like, it's something, it's something like that. So it's um, Detroit can clearly give the most. I don't know if Detroit is going to want to give as much and pay that in division tax for him to go there. And I don't know if Ottawa is going to want to deal as much with Detroit. So I think Dallas has that advantage there. I, I, it's, you look at value. I think you're going to be packaging a pick, a prospect, um, a good prospect, like, like a good one. Like you're going to have to give up a Bixel or a Bork or something like that. And I know people always like to hold on to prospects and everything like that. But at the end of the day, the Vegas Golden Knights, the LA Rams, they all they both said F them picks and they've won championships. Yeah. So like as much as if you think Maverick Bork makes your team better for the next if you think Maverick Bork like let's put it this way. If you think Maverick Bork makes your team better next season, if if you think Maverick Bork makes your team better over the next three seasons than Alex to Brinkett it does, then he's not worth trading. 
but I don't think he is. Like, I think Maverick Bork has a lot of potential and right. like, I'm excited to see what he can do. But over the next three seasons, no. I, yeah. I, I, I want to take the shirt. This team is in, I want to win a cup while Joe Pavelski is still around. Yeah. I want to win a cup while Jamie Benn is, like, I want to win a cup with this core. And I think you work so hard to protect assets and everything like that. And eventually you have to take the Vegas lesson and trade your late first round pick your late first round drafted prospect for an Ivan Barbashev, or in this case for an Alex to it and then package mm-hmm. something else to get it done. I, I think it's, I think it's something you do. And let's like, let's segue that too, to the, to the defense. I want the stars to, to the stars really need to shore up the blue line and everything like that. The other key question, and this is just the frustrating reality, Gavin is, do you see any free agents out there that are actually do that for you? No. <laughs> like, like I look at that list and I see, and I, and I go and I go down where I, I keep like, I want the defense to be better in Dallas. You want it to, you need, they need to be better, but a lot of it just keeps coming down to, um, I'm going to have to deescalate suitors role. Assuming Dallas doesn't buy him out, even though I think they should, I'm going to need Essel and Dell to refine some form. I'm going to need Nils Lundqvist to take some steps. I'm going to need Thomas Harley to take some steps because I don't see that piece out there in free agency that solves my problem that I ran into against Vegas. And obviously that's, that's frustrating and unfortunate, but I think sometimes maybe you solve the problem you know you can solve getting a scorer, locking him up for seven years and not punt the other problem down the road, but you try some bandages and everything like that. And maybe that's a space you have to isolate at the deadline. Mm-hmm. I, like I, I want, I, I, I keep, I'm getting more and more into that mindset simply because of, I just don't see the solution. I, I, I don't see solutions. I simply see mistakes when I look at free agency on the defense right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because even like a Gudis, is not going to oh, come yeah. cheap. And I love yes. his physical nature, but I mean, he's going to eventually, it's going to slow down by how physical he plays. But, you know, that's the well, kind of chip I would like on a one year, you know, $1 million yeah. deal. But that's not going to happen when he makes 2.5 right now. And I'm sure there are going to be teams that are going to try to match that to get him. Well, and it's, it's going to be like, are, are you going to pay like Dimitri Orla is probably going to make like six and a half yep. million yep. this year? Um, even a guy like Ryan Graves because of the, and I, I think Ryan Graves is actually a fine player, but the Ryan Graves is going to probably uh, projections I've seen have been around 5.1, 5.25 million yeah. for Ryan Graves. Like you yeah. want to pay Ryan Graves and Essel and Della combined 10 million. Right. A year? Like it's like, it's, um, it's, I, and then after that, like, honestly, is there any other defenseman that you would even want out of this class? I mean, like, like I go through the list of UFA defensemen. It's it's Orlov and Graves. Okay, in a vacuum, they make my team better. Um, Scott Mayfield doesn't make my team better. Yeah, like, he's not a bad player, but it's not like Scott Mayfield makes my team better. It's not like I mean, we John Klingberg's available again. I mean, like yeah. it's it's. I mean, maybe you still have the space for like a Carson Soucy type or something like that. But I think he played well enough in Seattle where he's going to like, I, I just, I don't see the solutions on defense in the free agency market. So maybe you pivot and you, and it's going to be a tough series because you're going to have to meet Vegas in the playoffs, but hopefully your defense has grown. And you know what? You look back to, you were right there with Vegas until the Jamie Benn incident in game three. Yeah. Yeah with your current defense course. So I, I, I keep thinking more about that. Yeah, I think I think if you look back, you wouldn't have had Domi and you wouldn't have had uh, the Don off, but the Chikrin trade, I know, kind of stung you and I um, yeah. because Ottawa yeah. could slip in and it was a good move for their future. And I think he would have been Oh, a great, nice great move. Great move by yeah, Ottawa. Yeah. So I think that looking back would have been, and, you know, I think the Stars are trying to build the decors in the, in the minors, but that's, um, you know, going to uh, uh, certainly – Take some take some time. So you know it it is interesting. I, I love the talk already. I love that players at least want to have Dallas on their list. I think it says a lot about Jim Nill. I think it says a lot about the franchise. Um, and I'm glad they're using this state tax thing 
as a as a as a way to uh, to to lure players. Uh, so, second thing we wanted to talk about on this podcast because we're trying to do deep dives this year, and mm-hmm. we did Ryan Suter last week, and today yep. we're going to talk about Jake Ottinger. We're going to talk about Jake Ottinger with the workload. We're going to talk about Jake Ottinger moving forward. Now, Jake Ottinger after the season um, did disclose that he was fighting an injury. Um, I don't think it inhibited him in any way, um, but at the same time, I'm always fascinated when the season ends and all these injuries come out. Um, But that injury, to me, Sean, you can speak about this further, but as a former goalie, uh, you know, when when teams were going high a lot on Jake Ottinger, you know, that might have been, been one of the reasons why, because that would have been a tougher space with what the injury was to to cover that angle. Um, but, you know, personally, the one thing that frustrated me throughout this playoff, Sean, and I know I'm the first to raise my hand and say Jake Ottinger could have played better at times. Mm-hmm. But I think Stars fans, I'm just going to throw this out there. I think people got used to how good Jake Ottinger was. So that any diminished play, people were almost treating it like Dak Prescott as quarterback, where no matter Mm -hmm. what else happened on the ice, well, I mean, you know, Ottinger let in two, Ottinger let in three. You know, I I think his, because he was so consistent during the season, I think that at times we uh, diminished him as a fan base. And so I wanted to start there. And a simple question to you, Sean, where do you consider Jake Ottinger? Because... I'm looking at close to me personally getting toward elite status. Um, there's there's the Shesterkins. There there are three or four goalies that I would say are above him, but I would say that he's right in the mix. Where do you see the fit for Jake Ottinger? Yeah, I mean, right now, like if I'm I'm looking at the top. Uh, I mean, Vasilevsky like have, for Vasilevsky had a down year, but I mean, I got to put yeah, him ahead of Ottinger. I mean, but I mean, has Vasilevsky had a nine? Vasilevsky's worst year of his career was this year, and it was a nine yeah, fifteen season. Exactly. So exactly. Like, I mean, like, like that's yeah. Like, like you look at like Vasilevsky, uh, Hellebuck, Shosturkin, yep, um, the Sorokin. I mean, yeah, it's a it's a great time for Russian goalies, isn't it? Boy, it um, is. <laughs> Soros had a good um, year. Yeah, I mean, but Soros, I mean, I, I have Ottinger ahead of Soros, but. Yeah, I mean, to me, Soros and Ottinger are kind of are kind of in that. Yeah. It's to me like my top four right now would be probably would be Shostorkin with Shostorkin, it would be Sorokin, be Vasilevsky, and Hellebuck. Those would be my top yep, four. I agree. Right now, right now, no, now this is not like long term. This is right now. Um, but to have think, but to have the fifth or sixth best goalie in the NHL, yeah. with that kind and of I, scoring and I, punch and is and awesome. I, I think Ottinger is Ottinger and Soros are kind of right there um obviously Olmark Olmark season is kind of a weird one to diagnose right like obviously Olmark was great this year but I don't it's is so this I'm gonna I'm gonna pull an old hockey name out of the 90s for some people who uh ready so this is what does the name Jim Carrey mean to you Gavin (sighs) besides Dumb and Dumber Exactly. Um, <laughs> Sides down and down. So Jim Carrey, uh, Washington Capitals. Yeah, right on that. Jim yeah. Carrey, the Washington Capitals goalie. He uh, won the uh, what year was it? He won the Vesna Trophy in uh, during the ninety four ninety five season. Like you look at the nineties, look like goaltending in the nineties, right? The the Vesna trophies were went to in the nineties. It was. Uh, Grant Fuhrer, Patrick Waugh, Ed Belfour, uh, Hashik for, and then like Hashik wanted to, between 93 and 99, Hashik won it five of the six years. The one year it wasn't won by Hashik, it went to a goalie by the name of Jim Carrey. Mm-hmm. And Carrey was, wasn't a bad goalie. Like he had a, he, he won the Vesna that year. He had a, but it was, it was a, it was a, it was a one season blip where that's kind of, and that's what, I wonder, like, that's why I struggle with where to place Olmark on this list. Because if Olmark's going to go drop 938 save percentages and sub two goals yeah. against averages extensively forward, then obviously he needs, but like right now, I have a hard time putting Olmark in this top five list. Um, the other one that's weird just because, like, 
is Bobrovsky because obviously we saw what he did in the playoffs, but we have to remember part of the reasons he did what he did in the playoffs was because he was basically, they were afraid to start him for the last three weeks of the regular season. He's just so fragile, like wildly, wildly inconsistent. Yeah. Like, so um, I think between consistency and like Ottinger and Soros are right there kind of in that five, six range in the league right now. And that's, that's a really like, it's, becomes easy to nitpick and it's uh you've got to like i think you, you kind of have to embrace a good thing when you have it and i think sometimes we are a little you it's easy it's if you looked out and saw what some other teams had you'd be you'd be pretty happy with what what, what ottinger brings um, right because you, you and, and had, let, you let me just have, you, yeah let me just yeah. jump in sean and, and ask this question yeah. um as much as the Aiden Hill run was absolutely amazing, um, and he made some dynamite saves throughout the Stanley Cup playoffs, Jake Ottinger with that defensive core, how much better is he? Oh my God, yeah. It's I mean, it's like Hill was like, let's give Aiden Hill credit. You have yeah. to make the stops, but Aiden Hill and someone's going to make the mistake of overpaying Aiden Hill this summer. Um, it's uh someone is going to pay him way more money than he should make. And it's going to be, and we're going to see him come back to earth and it'll be, it'll be, it'll be a mistake for another team. The stars, if you put Ottinger on that Vegas team, you've got that, that Vegas team is even more unbeatable. And it's part of that is the Vegas team. I mean, this year it's, that that Vegas team, it was very fun to be a goalie on that Vegas team because of how well they block shots, how well they box out, how well they do everything. There's a reason they won. They won games at one point with four different goalies. It was very much similar to the NFL running back by committee. And I think that's this is gonna this is a really good segue here on this, where one of the things the stars need, and it's so important, they need Ottinger's uh, workload to be limited. Not because he can't handle playing sixty games, but because you don't want you you don't want you want him to be playing. If the Dallas Stars are going to win a Stanley Cup, there's going to be what's the, what's the number? There's going to be roughly a hundred games. No, let's see, eighty two plus. Well, there's going to be roughly like one hundred and five games in the season, and you need Jake Ottinger to play you probably need Jake Ottinger playing around. You want him around 80 games for total for when you include the regular season and four rounds, of the playoffs. Um, and that's at max. I would much rather prefer 70. Even um, we saw what happened to Connor Hellebuck. Connor Hellebuck got run down was, yep. was, was so overworked. And in that Vegas series was, was run down in the first round. Dallas needs to find a solution to get Jake Ottinger to a uh, like, closer to closer to uh, the 55 start range. Like, honestly, like I know it's people will think like, Oh, we can play or whatever. Like I think the team, I think teams that win cups teams going forward, goalie workload, you want the best version of Jake Ottinger in May and June. And I think doing that is at him closer to 55, 55 starts as opposed to the 62 we played this year. And part of the reason he played as much as he did and it's something that the stars really have to take a good hard, good hard look at is they did not have an organizational number three that they trusted to play NHL games this year. Matt Murray's a good story, undrafted guy from UMass Damhurst, signed out, signed him to a deal, and everything like that midseason. Played okay when he got when he came in, but because of Scott Wedgwood's injuries, Jake Ottinger had to play even when his backup had to play more because his backup was hurt, and. I think Scott Wedgwood is a fine backup, but he doesn't. Um, I think he's a fine backup, but the problem is he he's got some injury. He, he deals with injuries a little bit and everything like that. And I need my backup to be durable so my starter can get that rest. And um, and if he's not going to be durable, I need a number three that I trust. Like I go back to when the Stars had Mike McKenna in the organization, or when they had Christopher Nilstorper in the organization. Having the organizational number three is so vital that when if the, the break, in, break glass in case of emergency goalie is there, Vegas had it. 
Florida had it this year with Alex Lyon. Um, honestly, like I, I don't think Alex, if I'm Alex Lyon, I don't know if I'd want to go to Dallas, but like Alex Lyon's a UFA this summer and we saw what he did and late in the season. Like I, if I'm, if I'm, and, and if, 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 if Spencer Knight's coming out of the player assistance program soon, Alex Lyon is probably, if I'm Dallas, I'm calling Alex Lyon's agent because I think Alex Lyon would be a tremendous number organizational number three. I think the star, the stars need a goalie like that in the system who understands his role, understands his spot is to, to help grow the other young goalie in Austin, but then is also there and, and can handle the role when he, the stars didn't have that. And I really think it hurt Ottinger's overall performance down the stretch. Um, it's the, it's like having insurance, right? You, you, you buy it because, and you hope to never use it. Yep. But if you don't, but if you don't buy it and then the hailstorm breaks through your window, you're, you're screwed. So you have Wedgwood for one more year. He's mm-hmm. signed and the stars recently re-signed Matt Murray. Yeah. So and to be you- clear and to be clear, I'm, I'm not, I'm not advocating for getting rid of Scott Wedgwood. Mm-hmm. My, my point more so is there needs to be, if Scott Wedgwood is your two and he's a fine two, you need a number three that you actually trust. And with Matt Murray right now, I, I don't know. Like, I don't really, I, I, it's, I think he's a, he's an AHL goalie. Like, I think he's like, I think he's been okay. I think he's fine. I haven't really seen the thing that jumps out to me. Um, to me, as far as, um, being a potential NHL guy, I think I see a little bit more out of Remy Poirier long-term, not next year, but I think long-term, maybe Remy Poirier a little bit more out of that. Um, so I, I just, I, I, I don't, to me, Matt Murray is, he, he's another Landon Bow to me. That's what he is. And Landon Bow was good for the organization. He, he's actually the, he, he did, he did a nice job in Texas could fill in occasionally when there was multiple injuries, but I don't see Matt Murray as more than that right now. And like, I want the stars to go sign Alex Lyon. I think that's the, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's the move that, um, now Alex Lyon probably won't be available because another team will probably sign him for a bigger role because what he did to help Florida get where they were. So it's, it's a, it's a give and take here, but it's, there's, there's a, whether it's bringing someone in from the outside or convincing yourself as a coaching staff that you trust Matt Murray, one of those two things needs to happen. So Jake Ottinger's workload goes down. So you get a better version of Ottinger in May and June when wear and tear or start to set in. Does Matt Murray fall into the case of a guy that if he was drafted in the second or third round, we wouldn't be saying what we do about him? Because I'm looking just purely at stats and 25 years old, undrafted, played at a high level in college at Hockey East, um, mm-hmm. but then comes in, has a really, really good year um, for Texas. You know, couldn't take him to the Calder Cup finals, but yeah. pretty darn close. Uh, ends, uh, let's see. Two point three seven uh, goals against in the um, playoffs uh, slowed down a little bit, but you know, I, I just looking at the stats alone, and I, I'm saying okay. And when he did come up, there were flashes at times, not consistent, but you know, I don't think we saw enough of him. But I remember that Chicago game, and you know, looked decent. So, I guess the question is, Sean, is what will they be looking for to say okay? Let's continue to look at him because let's just say, I, I agree with you. If they bring in Alex Lyon, you have a, a proven guy that is going to be your insurance. But what does that do to Matt Murray? And do they even care at that point? Is Matt Murray just a, a guy in the organization that, you know, when the contract's up, they just say, all right, see you later. I mean, and they, and they did re-sign him recently. And I think that's a fine re-signing, but to me, I, I don't see him as a, like, I don't see him as someone you plan your NHL future around. He's 25. He's, I think he kind of is what he is at this point. And, uh, I like, he was like, he was okay. He was, he had okay year in Texas, right? Like it was nine eleven save percentage, had a couple shutouts. He was okay. Um, I see more of a, I think, but I think he's kind of, he's kind of set as he, who is he as a goalie where I think Remy Poirier has a little bit more growth and kind of take a couple more steps. Like 
like Murray's 25. I think people forget that, right? Like, like it's easy to, it's easy to think about a guy um, like, like, Oh, well, he's in the AHL. He's 25. Like he's actually older than Jake. Yeah. He's older than Ottinger. So it's like, it's not like we're talking about someone who, Oh, he could be the backup in three years. No, he'll be 28. He'll be out of the organization. Uh, Poirier to me is 21 still has some time to develop. Um, has a, has a bit of a chance. I, I don't make my plans around Matt Murray. What I do is I think, I do think there is a benefit in having, um, I do think there's a benefit in having Murray and another veteran AHL goalie for Texas, number three, splitting the net in Texas and using, uh, and letting Poirier start and be kind of the guy in Idaho and playing a bunch of games. So, as 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 well, Adam Shield I think was good for Idaho this year. I just don't really see it with I with Shield. Like it's it's to me he's a he's he'll be a very good ECHL goalie, um, but he doesn't have the really the foundation to be that guy that goes beyond that. He was kind of rocked a little bit when he did play in the AHL this year. So, um, the Stars were supposed to have that this year with Hudobin was supposed to be that number three this year right. he was supposed to be that guy but his contract and his play stopped him from doing that and it's kind of a shame because if maybe there was an old version of anton hudobin you never know maybe jake onger is not as banged up as he was in in in, in down when, when when it mattered at the end of the season yeah yeah absolutely okay so you know clearly regardless they have to give ottinger more rest. And if Wedgwood yes, doesn't go yeah. down, I'm sure they did they would give Ottinger more rest. I guess the the second part we talked about Murray is how reliable is Wedgwood? Um yeah. and, and that's something I guess the stars have to, you know, figure out. How well, hard yeah, is it and, and yeah. how hard is yeah. it to go get a goalie if the season's already, you know, begun? If we're in preseason, let's say, and Wedgwood goes down, then what? Yeah, well, I think you have. This is once again. I think it's it has to be an insurance thing. You have to go into this season thinking, how do we go and we get? How do we find that number three going in right away? I think you have to be honest with yourself and do it off the bat. Um, and I, I keep using. I mean, Lion is one, but I don't like Alex Lion is probably not going to be the guy because someone else will scoop him up and he'd probably clear waivers. But, um, and you find like a Magnus Helberg or something like that like i think magnus helberg is a great organizational number three can you bring him in to be the guy um that's uh that to me is kind of that's the space or you even see um i mean we saw last night the in coachella the the coachella valley firebirds the the seattle ahl Heck yeah who they um they're they got a game seven wednesday by the way if uh fine i know it's not the easiest channel to find but if you can find NHL Network Wednesday night, you got a game seven for a championship Wednesday Absolutely. night. Absolutely. Not to mention one of the yeah. most historic hockey teams in North America playing yep. Coachella Valley in the Hershey Bears. Yep. And uh but they they're in, one of the reasons they are where they are is Joey Decord, who is a pretty good number three that if Seattle ever had to go to him, he would have been good, he would have been pretty good. So and he helped them reach the cup final. I mean, Dallas saw it with Mike McKenna, where he helped take Texas to the Calder Cup final in 2018. I think it's it's a space where you make that move now. And if you never if if you don't ever need him, it's like a good insurance policy. If you do need him, it's a good insurance policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, absolutely. Um, you know, wanted to also add before we say goodbye for now. You know, we. We were talking about Alex DeBrincat, and you had mentioned mm-hmm. Nashville, and I think yeah. it's wise to also add new coach Andrew Brunette, who loves scoring, yeah. as well as Barry Trotz, looking to make an impact. So I think Nashville, as you mentioned, Sean, I think that could be in the mix. They see what the Stars are doing. They see, you know, obviously the division with Colorado, and, you know, it, it's a tough division to move up. Minnesota had a good year, so I think Nashville has to make some um, bigger than normal um, moves to to try to get you know Brunette's offensive system in quick. Yeah, and I, I think Nashville will be um, next week at the draft. They'll be they'll be. I, I think the draft is in Nashville, and they will have a chance to 
to to make a bit of a statement and uh i think it's uh it will definitely be i think barry trotz wants to make his mark and i think this one if they are in on big fish like this it wouldn't surprise me so if you miss father's day i can't think of a better reason to make to <laughs> say, dad listen I missed you on Sunday. I told you a gift was on the way. There's an author called Sean Shapiro. <laughs> and the name of the book is We Win Here. So um, get yourself a copy and uh, help Sean feed the kiddos and keep everyone happy and keep them happy on spits and suds. So how's the book selling? Pretty good. Pretty good. good. It's, we've, the numbers have been good. It's been, it's been good. And I mean, honestly, can't think of a... Better post Father's Day activity than to sit around with uh, with with your dad and listen to spits and suds before uh, and then discussing <laughs> discussing the book at the same time, right? <laughs> Little book club, right? <laughs> so that's really funny because Bobby Belt on the morning show here at one hundred five three The Fan has come to me and said, "I really want to get into hockey. I, I think it's mm-hmm. important." And based on the stars' run, so I presented him with Sean Shapiro's book, "Everything You Need <laughs> to Know as a Dallas Stars Fan." I think the correct title awesome. is awesome. 100 things yeah 100 thing 100 things stars fans need to know and do before they die it's a great uh he yeah. was so excited and he started reading it this past weekend so there we go yeah yeah absolutely a lot of good, lot of good history there know your history learn from it so yeah <laughs> no, a- absolutely so we got the upcoming nhl draft as you mentioned we have free agency coming up so we have a lot of off-season programming to go you're a beast my man all right Let's once again, the Debrinket News, you have an article today on Shot, mm-hmm. so go follow Sean at Sean Shapiro. He posts it, and you can read it at Chapshot. You can also read his stuff at EP Rinkside. You have the book, We Win Here. You're always getting tidbits on spits and suds that somehow come to fruition. So you're a beast, yeah. my friend, and uh, uh, continued success, and uh, we'll see what uh, – this is fun, man. This is uh, This is a good time of year to get – excited when you have a team on the brink and you're like what will happen what pieces will we add do we have salary cap space you know how can we move things around it's it's nice to be in this position as a dallas stars fan Mm -hmm. it is it's a good time it's uh obviously it stings a little bit when you look at the team you lost to won the whole thing but it's 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 this time of year is fun it's i know it's the off season but it's uh opportunity and it's uh, yeah we're, we're gonna have some fun talking about it too yeah absolutely and and the one thing i'll say about vegas sean is is like you know you hate to see you're right lose to the team that wins the stanley cup but just the one thing i'll say about vegas all season despite the injuries despite everything going on just consistency was the word they were just consistent and they just weren't going to take florida's bait and it just looked like florida just got too tired obviously losing kachuk and uh Happy for that organization. I mean, for six years, they've been wheeling and dealing to make it happen. It finally happens. Um, if if it all caves in, at least they have a Stanley Cup in Las Vegas now. So it'll be interesting to watch them. And the other thing, too, just to be real quick, and I know it wasn't an expansion franchise, but I one thing I want to say, Stars won the Cup in six, too. Like, the, the, it was from a Stars fan. I know people, or there's some people who are like, oh, lifelong Vegas fans. Blah, blah, blah. Stars fans. Don't throw stones when you're in glass houses. You didn't have an NHL team till '93. You won the cup in '99. Yeah. It was literally it was the it was the exact same time. Frame. Right. And so low. So I just as a as a from a from a from a like lifelong Vegas fans and a Dwight or whatever like as Stars fans, you got the cup in six and you yeah. saw what it did. You Absolutely. Saw, you saw how it you saw how it grew the market. You saw how it grew the sport in Dallas. You saw that like. Just be happy. Like, don't like it's I, I get you want to be the team that wins it all and everything like that. But it's think about the think about the if you're it's it's same. I'm sure people could have Twitter didn't exist in 99, but the amount of people who would have been tweeting in 99 other after than tweeting about the way the goal was scored, they would have been tweeting about, oh, my yeah. God, the team, the lifelong fans, six years like would have been sipping the same the same thing about the Stars fans. And you know what? You don't care. So don't, so don't, so if you want to be upset about having lost. You, you want to be a little bitter about having not won it. That's fine. But don't, don't take it out on the Vegas hockey fans. That That's no. a, a great hockey community. And just because it's been, just because it's only been six years since they had a franchise, 
that to me is, I think that's a narrative where people kind of run down that hill and it just kind of frustrates me because Dallas won in six too. There was no NHL team in Dallas right. until 93. And then within six years of what, and then in year six, they won the cup. So just, just be, just hope that, uh, just it's, it, if anything, just, uh, if anything, Dallas can be a cautionary tale for Vegas. You know what? Just because you win it in six years doesn't mean you're going to win it anytime soon after that. And obviously, hopefully Dallas True. reverses that. But it's like embrace it. Enjoy it if you're in Vegas. If you're a Dallas fan, think about how close you were. And yeah. Hope the team is uh, and, and kind of look at where the team's going. Right. And this team is going to consistently be a contender. There's a reason players like to bring out want to come here. There's a reason that this team is going to is 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 built like they are it is a good time to be a stars fan and if you're in the final four in hockey if you're seattle if you're florida i mean seattle didn't need any help because they just started but i mean think how many people are looking forward to that hockey season upcoming think how many season yeah. ticket holders you know signed up or you know new season ticket holders came into florida as they created excitement in town and even here in dallas the place was buzzing everyone was talking about the dallas stars that's terrific for the organization and the future of the organization. That helps with sponsorships, helps with a lot of things. So, I mean, overall, solid year. Yeah, you want to be, you know, we wish that parade was happening here in Dallas, but at the same time, you know, when you look at the building blocks of this franchise, the veterans, and then the guys they have coming up, a lot of excitement in the air about hockey here in DFW. So thanks for Sean mm-hmm. Shapiro, and uh, we will have a pretty cool program for you next week as well. I'm Gavin Spittle once again. If you enjoy Spits and Suds, please tell your friends that, you know, we are doing off-season programs. Let's keep the momentum going that we gained in this playoffs. So continue to download episodes, press favorites, press subscribe so it comes right to your mobile phone or whatever device you're using. So for Sean Shapiro, I'm Gavin Spittle. Have a great day, everyone, and thanks for your support of Spits and Suds.